All right, why don't you stand with me, please, as we read 1 Kings 18, 17 through 24. It's a passage that you're familiar with, and I think it's time that we looked at it once again. 1 Kings 18 and verse 17, And it came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal 450, and the prophets of the Grove 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him, but if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Then said Elijah to the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood, and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on the wood, and put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. Our Heavenly Father, I pray this morning as we look into your word, we thank you that we serve the God, my God. And I pray that our allegiance would be to you. No mixed message, no trying to live in the world and live in the church. That our hearts would be sold out resigned to our Savior. Lord, bless this time, please. Thank you that we're here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As you look at the story this morning, in our text, you'll see some decisions that are highlighted that the Israelites had made. And obviously, there's a lot of lessons here for us. Number one, it starts out, and it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah. Now, Elijah had not been on the scene for three and a half years, and the backstory would be in chapter 17 and verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite was one of the inhabitants of Gilead, in verse 1, and said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. So according to Elijah's word, he had shut off the rain, and now we are in a time of drought for three and a half years. Now, the rain was not shut off because Elijah had the power to do so. The rain was shut off as judgment from God because of the behavior of the Israelites. And so what we notice in verse number 17 is that as he runs into King Ahab and there was this meeting after three and a half years, the question from the king is, "'Art thou he that troubleth Israel?' Aren't you the one causing the trouble? And I'll tell you what, you and I as Christian folks, we are the ones causing the trouble, in case you don't know it. And that's, there are so many things that went on back in the times of Elijah that history is repeating itself today, and it doesn't really make any notice. We don't know who Elijah was. All of a sudden, he's on the scene in chapter 17. Now, we're not sure who he was, but we know what he stood for. I think we'd do well for you and I. We don't need to be famous, but it would be helpful if people knew what we stood for. And so, number one, the man of God was the bad guy. Number two, the people of Israel had forsaken God. If you go back with me, now remember in verse 18 he says, it's because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and has followed Balaam, B-A-A-L-I-M, okay? Now, let's have a little class this morning, and we've got to move quickly. But if you go back with me in your Bible to the book of Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2 and verse 10. We're going to have a little class on who Balaam was. Judges 2.10 says, And also all that generation were gathered into their fathers... And there rose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Okay? Now we've got a generation of people that, that obviously Moses was the great lawgiver, the leader of 
the Israelites. They had gone out into the desert. God had used them for 40 years. Moses was taken, and obviously God declared that his business was done. God buried him somewhere where we don't know where the grave is, and Joshua took over. Joshua was a wonderful leader who followed the commandments of God and, and was a great follower of Moses. All of those people saw the miracles of Egypt and the plagues, and they saw how God sustained them in the wilderness that we'll be studying in the month of May with Brother Calder. And all of those things were incredible miracles that took place that they were eyewitnesses of. But after all of that now, those people have all died off. They never saw those things. And their children are now risen up. And the Bible records that they had not seen all those miracles that were done. And for some reason, shame on the parents, whatever it is, and shame on you and I, when we are not passing on what we know to be true to the next generation. Don't miss that. It is critical that you and I, as parents and grandparents, as we raise our children, in Deuteronomy, we're told to diligently teach our children. And the fact of the matter is that is work, and it's a job that we are called to do. And the Israelites had not done that. Now we've got a generation of people that did not know God, did not follow God, and they were no longer interested in the things of God, and they have chosen their own gods, which are Balaam. Now, Baal was obviously one god that is mentioned, and it's also in verse number, I want to look where it talks about the groves, right here, verse number 19, now therefore send and gather to me, in our text of 1 Kings 18, 19, gather to me prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400. Now you've got 850 heathens here, that's what you have, God deniers, followers of idols, Ahab was the king, and Jezebel was the queen. You'd never name your daughter Jezebel. Don't go there. I've never met a Jezebel, and uh, I hope I never do. That's not a name that your child would grow up and do well with. But Ahab was the king, and Jezebel was the queen. Jezebel was a Canaanite princess from Phoenicia that had no care for the faith of Israel and brought her idolatrous worship with her into the realm of Ahab. Let me stop right here for a second, and, and it's not noted in my notes. But who you hang out with and who you associate with is who you will become. It's good for God's people to hang out with God's people. If you start wandering and straying and getting involved with people that don't think like you and I do, yes, we are absolutely supposed to reach out to them. We are told to go out and reach a lost and dying world, and we love them and we care for them. But for the crowd I'm going to hang out with, I'm hanging out with Christians because the iron sharpens iron. Now, having said that, I don't know what Ahab's problem was. Maybe Jezebel was just this, if you, I can be so loose, gorgeous babe that he couldn't say no to. That's what happened to Samson and Delilah. Now, come on, Samson, what are you thinking? This woman wants to destroy you, and you can't stay away from her. You are an idiot, okay? Now, having said that, Ahab must have been one of these types of individuals. He couldn't stay away from Jezebel, and they ended up getting married, and they had nothing of faith in common. And Jezebel led Ahab into a life of debauchery. Now, I'm not saying Ahab was innocent in this, but obviously, this was the choice that he made. She had the 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of the groves were all fed and paid for, by Israeli tax dollars financed by Jezebel to be her counselors and idolatrous priests governing the state. So when Elijah confronts Ahab and says, you've got 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the groves, that is Baal, and it also is the, the goddess um, Ash, um, hang on just a second. Baal in a Canaanite culture was the son of El and was both a heroic figure as a storm god and a fertility deity who was worshipped in the many cult centers around the various forms, hence Balaam. Balaam is just the plural word for Baal. It's not one god, it's many gods. Okay? Ashtaroth was the goddess of erotic love and war. She was known in the ancient Near East as Ishtar or Astarte. The Canaanite worship rites were carried out not only in the temples, but on every high hill and under every green tree. 
It was to this God that Jeremiah spoke out against, identifying her as the queen of heaven in Jeremiah 44, 17. And there are other things that we could say about um, Ishtar. And uh, some of that stuff, I've mentioned it in the past. It's not in my message today. We could go there at some point. But the reality of it is the worship of a female deity was brought into the Catholic Church when the Catholic Church started out, and that's why you see the veneration of Mary as the mother of Jesus. But that's another topic altogether. Number one, the man of God was the bad guy. Number two, the people of Israel had forsaken God. Number three, the, Israel of, the leadership of Israel had not stopped practicing religion. They chose another God. And number four, the people of Israel were divided in their own minds who it was that they should follow. 1 Kings 18.21 says, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. I find it interesting that Charles Ryrie says, that they had not totally rejected Yahweh, but sought to combine his worship with Baal worship. I've got a clip that Ravi Zacharias had on a panel that Elijah is going to play. And Elijah, when I'll tell you when to stop it. It goes into a second part. All I want is the part that Ravi said. So go ahead and play it until I tell you we're done. Please. There's another angle of this which uh, I, I will address, and that is that these emergent churches are going to produce a generation of people who actually will not be able to handle the challenge of Islam and other major world religions. They will not be able to handle it. And uh, my wife and I were having dinner with a very notable gentleman, I shall leave unnamed, but he was, um, he says he communicates to more people across television than anybody else in the world at any, on any given day. And they, I uh, won't say too much more, but we was sitting across the table and he said he'd just been talking to a Muslim scholar and came away quite impressed with the fact that he had not known that there was really not that much of difference between Islam and Christianity. So my wife and I were having dinner with him and my wife is very, very well controlled in her expressions and I thought she was going to choke at that moment. I had to just uh, turn over to her and calm her down. Uh, I said, uh, why did you say that? He said, well, you know, he talked about all the points of agreement we have and so on. I said, well, let's go from here. They don't believe we have the Bible, that the New Testament is lost. They don't believe Jesus is the Son of God. They don't believe he died on the cross. They don't believe he rose again from the dead. They don't believe he's coming again as king. Do you think there's a difference between what they believe and what we do? I said, they don't have the gospel. But you know, this is the problem. The Muslims have shown us up. We don't know what we believe. When they present their ideas to an average young Christian going to a, one, of the, one of these emergent churches, one of the most prominent of those churches draws about 20,000 on Sunday. You can read his book. In that entire book of having a better life now and best life now and so on, there is not one mention of the cross in it. There, there is no gospel there. And so, you know, along with all the other compromises, we're going to be shown up. And the whole idea of RC here, you can't show a counterfeit if you do not know what the genuine is. And I think that's a big price we are going to pay very dearly as a result of this kind of lack of property. So obviously, I, thought, I felt like after seeing that clip, and what Ryrie was saying is that they really weren't denying God. They were just trying to blend other things in with it. And boy, I see that going on today in our society. We want so much to attract others, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, that we're willing to water down the true message of Jesus Christ to make sure that we can all get along. And I'll tell you, that is an absolute disaster, and I believe that is what took place and why Israel became into such trouble and compromise with foreign gods just trying to get along with the people around them and it ended up destroying them. And they were asking, are you the one that troubles Israel? So what can we learn? I want to say before I go any further 
that serving God is never wrong. Only serving the world is. I love being a Christian. I, I, I wouldn't trade this for anything. We were in a we were in a uh, airport in New York here this past week, and and Emily and I we uh, mortgaged the farm and bought a sandwich while we were at the airport, and <laughs> and uh, so we're sitting down, and, and uh, there were, we were at this table, and if you've been at LaGuardia, obviously there's really no private space there. You're going to sit next to someone, whatever, and so. But we always pray before we eat, so we held hands and we prayed. And, and there was a gentleman sitting next to us, and he was reading a book. And so I said the prayer I say over food, watch the kids and protect them. And I didn't say they're with the in-laws. I don't know how that's going to go. But anyway, you know, you're praying for the family and bless the food and, and amen. And, and obviously in Jesus' name. And I didn't think anything about it. And the guy next to me, he looked over and he says, thank you for the prayer. I thought, I didn't say anything to him. I looked at him and I said, well, we could have included you in that, but I didn't. And, but I just couldn't help but think what I should have said is, I love being a Christian. I don't care whether you liked my prayer or not. I'm thankful you did, but I love being a Christian. I just love what Christ offers. I love the freedom that we have. No other faith system in the world can give you what Jesus Christ has. Whatever you are enticed to, whatever you think will make you happier, whatever decision in life you think you're going to choose that will take care of all the issues in your life, I want you to know that Jesus is better. Don't you forget it. Now, having said that, by every human measure, now I'm talking human, as you look around in society, we are not winning. Now, I hate to say that. I can remember it was a time in 2000, in that range, 2001, when we were battling cancer with my first wife, and I walked into the office that day, and one of the employees asked me how it was going. And I looked at him and I says, we are not winning. Because every report was bad. And I don't know about you, but I, I read the paper and I look at society and I see families falling apart, even in our churches. And I recognize that, humanly speaking, man, we're not winning. It frustrates me. The choices people are making, really? I don't want to be negative this morning, but there's some things that we need to be serious about and look at. This past week in the legislature, here in our own state capitol, they're debating conversion therapy. Now, if you've been following that story at all, what they are trying to pass for a law in the state of Maine is that if your child, and I'll use my son Cody, if Cody comes to me and says, Dad, I know I'm born a boy, but I'm really a girl. I've decided to be a girl, I am a girl, that's the way it is. And I'll say, son, this isn't right. We need to go and talk to the pastor. We need to find someone that can help you and realize, point out to you that if you have a cat, we're not going to call it a dog. It's a cat. And if we had a cat and we named it Bozo and said it was the family dog, people would look at us and say, man, you're whacked out. On the other hand, it is becoming accepted in society that if a girl says she's a boy, we cannot tell her she's a girl. Now, what in the world is that all about? Now, mark it down at the review tomorrow on Monday that I got one preach it on the schedule, okay? <laughs> so, but this is just, honestly, society is becoming bizarre, okay? Now, I, I, I don't want to go too long here, but a, a friend of this church got in trouble in the legislature for, and I'll, I'll read to you what was said about him. Representative Roger Reed, Republican from Carmel, sparked angry objections from supporters when he read from a constituent letter calling the bill, quote-unquote, extremely dangerous and an attempt by the LGBT community to legitimize the unnatural inclinations now approved by society over the natural inclinations as taught to us in the Bible. As tempers rose on the House floor, a clearly frustrated Speaker of the House, Gideon, halted debate and shut down the floor session for more than 25 minutes before letting Reed continue. I want to stop, and it's not in the letter, but I know for a fact 
that, that Roger Reed was hauled into her office and spoken to about the tone that he was taking on this. Okay, I'll continue on. 25 minutes before letting Reed continue his firebrand speech about America losing its moral compass by straying from the church. And he said, I take real issue with bills that are put forth by this legislature that meddle in the affairs of the American family, Reed said. There are some things that we should not tolerate, and this is one of them. Now, I want to say I applaud Roger Reed for taking that stand. <laughs> now, having said that, you give me just a second. It, notice in the speech, he was called a firebrand. Okay? Now, I thought, you know, a firebrand is not a term that we use on a regular basis, so I had to go to my Funkin' Wagnalls and look it up. And the Merriam-Webster dictionary that you can find online says of a firebrand, one that creates unrest or strife, an agitator. So you and I now are the ones, moral law. I just want you to know that getting married, husband and wife, getting a job, paying your bills, living as God would have us, we are the firebrands in society now. We are the agitators. Well, I don't know who the liberal writer was that wrote that article, but I want you to know most people that you and I are rubbing shoulders with do not think that. We are not in the minority in the United States of America. We may be in the legislature, because those are the people that we put in to represent us, and the reality of it is, that bill passed the legislature, now it's going to the Senate. And if somebody doesn't stop this thing, it's going to be illegal for me to tell you that if your boy was born a boy, he's a boy, because that's the way God made him. This is an absolute affront to the teachings of the Word of God and moral law that has gone on for thousands of years. But now in 2018, we're smarter than all that. But I'll tell you what, we were smarter when we were dumber. Because this isn't working, folks, and no society can last if we continue in this direction. It bothers me. We're running out of time, so I'll, I'll bring it to a close. So there's some other things I'd like to mention, but here we go. So what do we do? Three things. Number one, so what happened? You know the story of Elijah. He confronted them. They went on for hours trying to get the fire to light because they were supposed to call down fire from heaven. They were jumping on the altar, the prophets of Baal. Well, if you thought that thing was going to explode in a ball of fire, I don't think I'd be on the altar. But obviously, that's what happened. Finally, they wore out, tired out. Elijah is doing the, the politically incorrect thing of mocking them and making fun of them, which the worst thing you can do in society today is hurt someone's feelings. Oh, please don't do that. I mean, there's, people are fragile. I'll tell you what, anyway. So, I'm sure Elijah hurt their feelings, and then it was his turn. He rebuilt the altar that was broken down. He put it all back together, buried it in water, prayed to God, a 63-word prayer in the King James Version Bible, and the fire of God fell. Here's what needs to happen for you and I as Christians. Number one, we need to repair the altars in our life. That we've drifted from God. Even if you're in church, sometimes we can drift. And it shows in our actions and the choices that we make and the world is watching us. What's our altars? In the, well, number one is the church. Number two is the cross. It's those things that we come together and we celebrate the cross. Because it's where our Savior died, and He bought our pardon so that you and I could have eternal life, so our sins could be forgiven. Not only that, I believe another altar in our life is the church. Jesus said He'd build His church, and the gates of hell would not prevail against it, meaning that you and I are an offensive force. But what happens, what I've been seeing as a pastor, and so have you, is that rather than... In, than Hell not being able to hold us back. We want to peek through the gates of hell. We want to look over the walls of hell. We want to see what hell is doing so that maybe some of their good ideas they have, we could bring into our church, and then we'd all be able to get along. 
That's what it looks like to me. Well, I'll tell you what. The church of Jesus Christ is supposed to invade hell and destroy it and scare the crap out of them, not become friends with them. We've not done that. Shame on us for not being the warriors we've been called to do. The altar needs to be repaired. Number two, we need to repent of the past and determine not to repeat the downward trend in our own life. I've talked to different people about our schools going to pot, bringing guns in it, all of the stuff that goes on. And, and I said, you can trace this all back to the removal of the Bible and prayer in schools. It's, this isn't rocket science, folks. And, I, and they'll say, well, we can't go back. We can't go back. Well, whatever. But we could go forward doing the right thing. We can repent of the wrong things. And I think you and I need to recognize and be honest with ourselves that we've not always lived right. We've not always made the right choices. But what we do is we want to ask forgiveness of our sins but not change our life. And for some reason we seem to think we can get away with it. But there's a saying that's not mine but it's true. God's delay is not God's approval. And judgment is coming whether you think you're getting away with it or not. You're going to come to a bend in the road and it ain't going to be fun. We need to rebuild the altar. We need to repent of our past. And then we need to resign to the idea that there was an Elijah back then. And we need some Elijahs today. The, The title of my message is Calling All Elijahs that Elijah was 850 to 1. And I want you to know that being an Elijah is a lonely job. And it will be a job that you will be blamed for. And I found in the pastor, one of the things that just so frustrates me is that when you stand for right, you're the bad guy. So I just want you to know right now, if you decide that you're willing to be an Elijah, you're the bad guy. You will be the bad guy. And those that you think, we read a verse in Sunday school this morning that, 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 that in Zechariah is predicted, they'll look at his hands and they'll say, what happened to your hands? And he said, those are the injuries that took place in the house of my friends. And I'll tell you what, Christian, some injuries are going to take place to you for standing for God in church, in the house of your friends, because it's a lonely job. But I'll tell you what, It's a job that is very rewarding because you and I are still talking about Elijah. And those 850 prophets of Baal and Ashtaroth, we don't know who they were. And they all died off. And in hell they're lifting up their eyes in torment. But you and I are going to live forever serving our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We're not winning. But I'll tell you what. I want to go down fighting, scrapping, clawing. Loving Jesus, because let me tell you something, Jesus is better. Say that with me. Jesus is better. Heavenly Father, our time is gone. You go so quickly. Bragging about you is the greatest life. Thank you that you called me to be a preacher. Lord, there are decisions that are being made in our own church that you can't honor, you can't bless, and they think they can get away with it. It doesn't work that way. God, help us to to not just recognize our sin, but repent and agree with you that it's wrong and we won't do it anymore. Give us the courage to be Elijah's, to confront the evil in the land. Give us the courage as a church to not marry into the world and blend in Satan with Jesus and try to make everybody happy. Because it does not work. It ruined Israel, and it's ruining America, and it's ruining our gospel-preaching churches. We're not taking a census this morning to see what bothers people so that we don't go there. We're taking an issue this morning and asking you what bothers you so we don't ever go there. God, if there are folks here this morning that need you as their personal Savior, they need to say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be my Savior the greatest decision they could ever make. Lord, if there are Christians here that are practicing sin in their life and they know it, 
they need to stop it or you will punish them. I pray that they can judge themselves so that you would not have to. And God, I pray for some Elijahs that would have the courage of the Roger Reeds to stand up and say what needs to be said though he's being shouted down. God bless him. I pray that we would have had the courage to do the same thing. And we will have those opportunities. It's just a matter of time. When those opportunities come, I pray that we would not run from them, but we would embrace them knowing that that's what you've called us to do. Lord, we love you. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. I pray that we would respond. In Jesus' name, amen.